Peanut butter. Uh -huh. He's eating peanut butter. <coughs> I said he's eating peanut butter. Yeah. You want some? No. Got some peanut butter. I guess I would open up a jar. No. <coughs> you eat it out of the jar? <coughs> you eat it right out of the jar? That's not sanitary. Uh, That's not sanitary. Well, <laughs> uh, I want to do two, two spoonfuls. Okay. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, I want to go back the second time with a good spoon. <laughs> so that makes it okay? Uh -uh. But the first dip, yeah. when I come up with a spoon, I lick it off real good. <laughs> and then I'll stick it in the... Oh, so that yeah. makes it okay. But uh, <laughs> when I was a kid growing up, I used to suck chocolate syrup out of the can. <laughs> uh, well, chocolate syrup came in a can then. Not anymore. Uh, but... Uh, but, uh, well, that would be convenient now. You just drink it out of the bottle. Right. Uh, but I don't do that anymore. <laughs> That's a good thing. But I would, uh, would suck chocolate syrup out of the can. <laughs> and I used to like the... Mother would use... Condensed milk, you know, uh, sweet milk. Mm -hmm. Real thick, she would use that. And and I would suck that out of the can, too. <laughs> Condensed milk. Yeah. That's too sweet. <laughs> uh, that's why I've grown up so good. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, I ain't got no hook on this ball. You have to make one. You got a straw in here? No. Oh, my new ball. Did you decorate it yourself? Huh? Did you decorate it yourself? Uh, yeah, a long time ago. I had a woman on top and a, with a bra. Well, I'm glad you covered that up. Well, Helen made me cover it up. Well, good. You I didn't need take, to take it to church. I didn't take it off. I just put package tape over it. <laughs> uh, if I ever want to sell, I'll just to peel it off. I'm sure. Uh, uh, well, it, it ain't got... So this is a... A cover halfway around this, like with on other bottles. You see. Yeah. If I had a very creative, very creative. A plus. It's you a, don't have a straw. Uh, you don't have a straw. No, I don't have a straw on this. Don't spill it. So that's what it looked like. Uh, uh, it's really a, a plain bottle, you see. Yeah. Uh, you mix drinks in it. Oh, well, you ain't got no mixed drinks. <laughs> no. <laughs> it works. It works. Did you say a minute ago? Uh, What's uh, on the inside? Oh, that hook wasn't funny. What's on the inside or something? Uh, What's on the inside or something? The inside of something. What, what did you say a minute ago? 
Oh, I was saying, it's nothing on the inside except the bottle. Yeah. But what's outside can't get inside, you see, because yeah. it's a bottle. Unless it does what? <laughs> Unless it crawls over the top. <laughs> oh, I got a... I got a cartoon out of the paper around. Did you make him cover up the top? Uh -huh. <laughs> what about my car? Uh -huh. What about my car? It was hot on the outside of my hand. Well, why are you touching it? I had to hold on to get in. Well, I can't help it. And it's it hot. Was, and it's a hot car. Well, it's not hot in here. Well, uh, I turned the air on. Well, it won't cool outside, though. Well, it's not supposed to. Uh, well, <laughs> I put my hand on it to get in, and it burned my hand. Sorry. Third degree burn. Sure it was. <laughs> You're back. You're back. We're back. You're back. We're back. <laughs> oh, we're back. Where are you going? I'm back. Where did you go? <laughs> we went to the dollar store.
for I was trying out a fairly fruity cummerbund that morning. One of those silk contrivances, you know, which you tie around your waist, something on the order of a sash, only more substantial. I had seen it in a shop the day before and hadn't been able to resist it, but I know it all along that there might be trouble with Jeeves. It was a pretty brightish scarlet. I beg your pardon, sir, he said, in a sort of hushed voice. You are surely not proposing to appear in public with that thing. What? Cuthbert the Cummerbund, I said in a careless, debonair way, passing it off. Rather. I should not advise it, sir, really, I shouldn't. Why not? The effect, sir, is loud in the extreme. I tackled the blighter squarely. I mean to say, nobody knows better than I do that Jeeves is a mastermind and all that. But dash it, a fellow must call his soul his own. You can't be a serf to your valet. You know the trouble with you, Jeeves, I said. Is that your too, what's the word I want? Too bally insular. You can't realize that you aren't in Piccadilly all the time in a place like this, simply dripping with the gaiety and shall David Vrayel found in France. A bit of color and a touch of the poetic is expected of you. Why, last night at the casino, I saw a chappy in a full evening suit of yellow velvet. Nevertheless, sir, Jeeves, I said firmly, my mind is made up. I'm in a foreign country. It's a corking day. God's in his heaven, and all's right with the world, and this cummerbund seems to me to be called for. Very good, sir, said Jeeves coldly. Dashed upsetting, this sort of thing. If there's one thing that gives me the pip, it's unpleasantness in the home and I could see their relations were going to be pretty fairly strained for a while. I suppose the old brow must have been a bit burrowed or something, for Aline Hemingway spotted that things were wrong directly we sat down to lunch. You seem depressed, Mr. Wooster, she said. Have you been losing money at the casino? No, I said, as a matter of fact. I won quite a goodish sum last night, but something is the matter. What is it? Well, to tell you the truth, I said, I've just had rather a painful scene with my man, and it's shaken me a bit. He doesn't like this cummerbund. Why, I've just been admiring it. I think it's very becoming. No, really. It has rather a Spanish effect. Exactly what I thought myself. Extraordinary. You should have said that. A touch of the Adolfo. What? Sort of. Vincente y Blasco. What's his name stuff? The jolly old Hidalgo off to the bullfight. What? Yes. Or a corsair of the Spanish main. Absolutely, I say, you know. You have bucked me up. It's a rummy thing about you. How sympathetic you are, I mean. The ordinary girl you meet today is all bobbed hair and gaspers, but you. I was about to continue in this strain when somebody halted at our table and the girl jumped up. Sydney, she cried. The chappy who had anchored in our midst was a small, round cove with a face rather like a sheep. He wore pince nez. His expression was benevolent and he had on one of those collars which buttoned at the back, a parson, in fact. Well, my dear, he said, beaming pretty freely, here I am at last. Are you very tired? Not at all. A most enjoyable journey, in which tedium was rendered impossible by the beauty of the scenery, through which we passed, and the entertaining conversation of my fellow travelers, but may I be presented to, the, to this gentleman, he said, peering at me through the pit's nest. This is Mr. Wooster, said the girl, who was very kind 
to me coming from Paris. Mr. Booster, this is my brother. We shook hands, and the brother went off to get a wash. Sydney's such a dear, said the girl. I know you'll like him. Seems a topper. I do hope he will enjoy his stay here. It's so seldom he gets a holiday. His vicar overworks him dreadfully. Vicars are the devil. What? I wonder if you will be able to spare any time to show him around the place. I can see he's taking such a fancy to you. But of course, it would be a bother, I suppose. So, rather not. Only too delighted. For half a second I thought of patting her hand. Then I felt I'd better wait a bit. I'll do anything. Absolutely anything. It's awfully kind of you. For you, I said I would. At this point, the brother returned, and the conversation became what you might call general. After lunch, I fairly curveted back to my suite, with a most extraordinary braced sensation going all over me like a rash. Jeeves, I said, you were all wrong about that cummerbund. It went like a breeze from the start. Indeed, sir. Made an absolutely outstanding hit. The lady I was lunching with admitted it. She admired it. Her brother admired it. The waiter looked as if he admired it. Will anything happen since I left? Yes, sir. Mrs. Gregson has arrived at the hotel. A chappy I know who went shooting and was potted by one of his brother's sportsmen in mistake for a rabbit once told me that it was several seconds before he realized that he had contributed to the day's bag. For about a tenth of a minute, everything seemed quite okay. And then suddenly he got it. It was just the same with me. It took about five seconds for this fearful bit of news to sink in. What? I yelled. Aunt Agatha here? Yes, sir. She can't be. I have seen her, sir. But how did she get here? The express from Paris has just arrived, sir. But, I mean, how the dickens did she know I was here? You left a forwarding address at the flat for your correspondent, sir. No doubt Mrs. Gregson obtained it from the hall porter. But I told the chump not to give it away to a soul. That would hardly baffle a lady of Mrs. Gregson's forceful personality, sir. Jeeves, I'm in the soup. Yes, sir. Right up to the hocks. Yes, sir. What shall I do? I fear I have nothing to suggest, sir. I eyed the man narrowly. Dash it aloof, his manner was. I saw what was the matter, of course. He was still brooding over that cummerbund. I shall go for a walk, Jeeves, I said. Yes, sir. A good long walk. Very good, sir. And if I... Uh, if anybody asks for me, tell them you don't know when I'll be back. To people who don't know my Aunt Agatha, I find it extraordinarily difficult to explain why it is that she has always put the wind up to me, wind up me to such a frightful extent. I mean, I'm not dependent on her financially or anything like that. It's simply personality. I've come to the conclusion, you see, all through my childhood, and when I was a kid at school, she was always able to turn me inside out with a single glance, and I haven't come out from under the influence yet. We run to hide a bit in our family, and there's about five foot nine of Aunt Agatha, topped off with a beaky nose, an eagle eye, and a lot of gray hair, and the general effect is pretty formidable. Her arrival in Roval at this juncture had made things more than a bit complicated for me. What to do? Leg it quick before she could get hold of me. Would no doubt have been have, would have no doubt have been the advice most fellows would have given me. But the situation wasn't as simple as that. I was in much the same position as the cat on the garden wall, the one on the point of becoming matey with the cat next door, observes the bootjack sailing through the air. If he stays where he is, he gets in the neck. If he biffs, he has to start all over again, where he left off. I didn't like the prospect of being collared by Aunt Agatha, but on the other hand, I simply barred the notion.
notion of leaving Roval by the night train and parting from Malene Hemingway. Absolutely a man's crossroads, if you know what I mean. I prowled about the neighborhood all the afternoon and evening. Then I had a bit of dinner at a quiet restaurant in the town and trickled cautiously back to the hotel. Jeeves was popping about in the suite. There is a note for you, sir, he said, on the mantelpiece. The blighter's manner was still so cold and unchummy that I bit the bullet and had a dash of being hairy. A note, eh? Yes, sir. Mrs. Gregson's maid brought it shortly after you had left. Tra la la, I said. Precisely, sir. I opened the note. She wants me to look in on her after dinner sometime. Yes, sir. Jeeves, I said. Makes me a stiffish brandy and soda. Yes, sir. Stiffish Jeeves. Not too much soda, but splash the brandy about a bit. Very good, sir. He shimmied off into the background to collect the materials. And just at that moment, there was a knock at the door. I bound to say it was a shock. My heart stood still and I bit my tongue. Come in, I pleaded, but it wasn't an Agatha after all. It was a lean Hemingway, looking rather rattled than her brother, looking like a sheep with a secret sorrow. Oh, Mr. Wooster, said the girl in a sort of gasping way. Oh, what ho, I said. Won't you come in, take a seat or two? I don't know how to begin. Uh, I said, is anything up? Poor Sidney, it was my fault. I ought never to have let him go there alone. At this point, the brother who had been standing by, wrapped in the silence, gave a little cough, <coughs> like a sheep caught in the mist on a mountaintop. The fact is, Mr. Wooster, he said, I have been gambling at the casino. Oh, I said, did you click? He sighed heavily. If you mean, was I successful? I must answer in the negative. I rashly persisted in the view that the color red, having appeared no fewer than seven times in succession, must inevitably, at no distant date, give place to black. I was in error. I lost my little. All, oh, Mr. Wooster, tough luck, I said. I left the casino and returned to the hotel. There I encountered one of my parishioners, a Colonel Musgrave, who chanced to be holiday-making over here. I induced him to cash me a check for one hundred pounds on my bank in London. Well, that was all to the good. What? I said, hoping to induce the poor egg to look on the bright side. I mean, bit of luck, finding someone to slip it into. First crack out of the box. On the contrary, Mr. Wooster, it did make matters worse. I burned with shame as I make the confession, but I went back to the casino and lost the entire sum. I say, I said, you're having a night out. And, concluded the chappy, the most lamentable feature of the whole affair is that I have no funds in the bank to meet the check when presented. I'm free to confess that I gazed at him with no little interest in admiration. Never in my life before had I encountered a curate so genuinely all to the mustard. Little as he might look like one of the lads of the village, he certainly appeared to be the real Tabasco. Colonel Musgrave, he went on, copied someone, is not a man who would be likely to overlook the matter. He is a hard man. He will expose me to my vicar. My vicar is a hard man. I should be ruined if Colonel Musgrave presents that check and he leaves for England tonight. Mr. Wooster, the girl burst out. Won't you, won't you help us? Oh, do say you will. We must have the money to get back that check from Colonel Musgrave before nine o'clock. He leaves on the 9.20. I was at my wit's end 
what to do when I remembered how kind you had always been, and how you had told me at lunch that you had won some money at the casino last night. Mr. Wooster, will you lend it to us and take these as security? And before I knew what she was doing, she had dived into her bag, produced a case, and opened it. My pearls, she said, I don't know what they are worth. They were a present from my poor father. But I know they must be worth ever so much more than the amount we want. Dash it embarrassing made me feel like a pawnbroker, more than a touch of popping the watch about the whole business. No, I say really. I protested the haughty old spirit of the booster, boosters kicking like a mule at the idea there's no need of any security, you know, or any rod of that kind. I mean to say, among pals, you know what? Only too glad the money, money will come in useful. And I fished it out, pushed it across. The brother shook his head. Mr. Wooster, he said, we appreciate your generosity, your beautiful heart and confidence in us, but we cannot permit this. What's Sydney mean, said the girl. Is that you really don't know anything about us? When you come to think of it, you mustn't, you mustn't, you mustn't risk lending all this money without any security at all to two people who, after all, are almost strangers. Oh, don't say that. I do say it. If I hadn't thought that you would be quite businesslike about this, I would never have dared to come to you. If you will just give me a receipt as a matter of form. Oh well, I wrote out the receipt and handed it over, feeling more or less of an ass. Here you are, I said. The girl took the piece of paper, shoved it in her bag, grabbed the money, and slipped it to Brother Sidney. And then before I knew what was happening, she had darted at me, kissed me, and legged it from the room. I don't know when I've been so rattled. The whole thing was so dashed, sudden, and unexpected. Through a sort of mist, I could see that Jeeves had appeared from the background and was helping the brother on with his coat. And then the brother came up to me and grasped my hand. I cannot thank you sufficiently, Mr. Wooster. Oh, right ho, you have saved my good name. Good name in man or woman, dear my lord, he said, massaging the fin with some fervor, is the immediate jewel of their souls. Who steals my purse, steals trash, twas mine, tis his and has been slave to thousands. But he that filches from me my good name robs me of that which not enriches him and makes me poor indeed. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Good night, Mr. Wooster. Good night, old thing, I said. Your brandy and soda, sir, said Jeeves, as the door shut. I blinked at him. Oh, there you are. Yes, sir. Rather a sad affair, Jeeves. Yes, sir. Lucky I happen to have all that money handy. Well, uh, yes, sir. You speak as though you didn't think much of it. It is not my place to criticize your actions, sir. But I will venture to say that I think you behaved a little rashly. What? Lending that money? Yes, sir. These fashionable French watering places are notoriously infested by dishonest characters. This was a bit too thick. Now look here, Jeeves, I said. I can stand a lot. But when it comes to your casting asp, whatever the word is, on the sweetest girl in the world, and a bird in only orders, perhaps I am over suspicious, sir, but I have seen a great deal of these resorts. When I was in the employment of Lord Frederick Ranelagh, shortly before I entered your service, his lordship was very neatly swindled by a criminal known, I believe, by the sobriquet of 
of Soapy Sid, who scraped acquaintance with us in Monte Carlo with the assistance of a female accomplice. I have never forgotten the circumstance. I don't want to butt in on your reminiscences, Jeeves, I said coldly, but you're talking through your hat. How can there have been anything fishy about this business? They've left me the pearls, haven't they? Very well, then. Think before you speak. You had better be tooling down to the desk now and having these things shoved in the hotel safe. I picked up the case and opened it. Oh, great Scott! The bully thing was empty. Oh, my Lord, I said, staring. Don't tell me there's been dirty work at the crossroads after all. Precisely, sir. It was in exactly the same manner that Lord Frederick was swindled on the occasion to which I have alluded, while his female accomplice was gratefully embracing his lordship. So be said, substituted a duplicate case for the one containing the pearls, and went off with the jewels, the money, and the receipt. On the strength of the receipt, he subsequently demanded from his lordship the return of the pearls, and his lordship, not being able to produce them, was obliged to pay a heavy sum in compensation. It is a simple but effective ruse. I felt as if the bottom had dropped out of things with a jerk. I mean to say... Aline Hemingway, you know, what I mean is, if love hadn't actually awakened in my heart, there's no doubt it was having a jolly good stab at it, and the thing was only a question of days, and all the time, well, I mean, dash it, you know, so be Sid, Sid, Sidney, Brother Sidney, why, by Jove, Chiefs, do you think that person was so be Sid? Yes, sir. But it seems so extraordinary. Why his collar button at the back? I mean, he would have deceived a bishop. Do you really think he was Soapy Sid? Yes, sir. I recognized him directly. He came into the room. I stared at the blighter. You recognized him? Yes, sir. Then dash it all, I said, deeply moved. I think you might have told me. I thought it would save disturbance and unpleasantness if I merely abstracted the case from the man's pocket, as I assisted him with his coat, sir. Here it is. He laid another case on the table beside the dud one, and by Jove you couldn't tell them apart. I opened it, and there were the good old pearls, as merry and bright as, damn it, smiling up at me. I gazed feebly at the man. I was feeling a bit overwrought. Jeeves, I said, you're an absolute genius. Yes, sir. Relief was surging over me in great chunks by now. I had almost forgotten that a woman had toyed with my heart and thrown it away like a worn-out tube of toothpaste and all that sort of thing. What seemed to me the important item was the fact that thanks to Jeeves, I was not going to be called on to cough up several thousand quid. It looks to me as though you had saved the old home. I mean, even a chappie endowed with the immortal rind of dear old Sid is hardly likely to have the nerve to come back and retrieve these little chaps. I should imagine not, sir. Well then, oh, I say, you don't think they are just paste or anything like that? No, sir. These are genuine pearls and extremely valuable. Well, then, dash it. I'm on velvet. Absolutely reclining on the good old plush. I may be down a hundred quid, but I'm up a jolly good string of pearls. Am I right or wrong? Hardly that, sir. I think that you'll have to restore the pearls. What? To Sid? Not while I have my physique. No, sir. To their rightful owner. But who is their rightful owner? Mrs. Gregson, sir. What? How do you know? It was all over the hotel an hour ago that Mrs. Gregson's pearls had been abstracted. The man said travel from Paris in the same train as Mrs. Gregson, and no doubt marked him down. I was speaking to Mrs. Gregson's maid shortly before you came in, and she informed me that the manager of the hotel is now in Mrs. Gregson's suite and having a devil of a time. <laughs> What? So I should be disposed to imagine, sir. The situation was beginning to unfold before me. I'll go and give them back to her, eh? I'll put me one up. 
mind. I think I am right, sir. Well, I stand on you if you say so. I'll be bobbing. What? The sooner the better, sir. Long before I reached Aunt Agatha's lair, I could tell the dawn was up. Divers, divers, chappies in hotel uniform, and not a few chambermaids of sorts were hanging out, hanging about in the corridor and through the panels. I could hear a mixed assortment of voices with Aunt Agatha's topping the lot. I knocked, but no one took any notice, so I trickled in. Among those present, I noticed a chambermaid in hysterics, and Agatha with her hair bristling, and a whiskered cove who looked like a bandit, as no doubt he was, being that the proprietor of the hotel. Oh, hello, I said. I got your note, Aunt Agatha. She waved me away, no welcoming smile for Bertram. Oh, don't bother me now, she snapped, looking at me as if I were more or less the last straw. Something up? Yes, yes, yes. I lost my pearls. Pearls, pearls, pearls. I said, no, really. Dash it, annoyed. Where did you see them last? What does it matter where I saw them last? They have been stolen. Here, Wilfred, the Whisker King, who seemed to have been taking a rest between rounds, stepped into the ring again and began to talk rapidly in French. Cut to the quick, he seemed. The chambermaid whooped in the corner. Sure you've looked everywhere, I asked. Of course I looked everywhere. Well, you know, I've often lost a collar stud, and do try not to be so maddening. Bertie, I have enough to bear without you, without your imbecilities. Oh, be quiet, be quiet, she shouted, in the sort of voice used by sergeant majors and those who call the cattle home across the sands of D. As such was the magnetism of what chiefs called her forceful personality, that Wilford subsided as though he had run into a wall. The chambermaid continued to go strong. I say, I said, I think there's something the matter with this girl. Isn't she crying or something? She stole my pearls. I am convinced of it. They started the whisker specialist off again, and I left them at it and wandered off on a tour around the room. I slipped the pearls out of the case and decanted them into a drawer. By the time I'd done this, and had leisure to observe the free-for-all once more, and Agatha had reached the frozen Grande Dame stage, and was putting the last of the bandits through it in the voice she usually reserves for snubbing waiters in restaurants. I tell you, my good man, for the hundredth time, that I have searched thoroughly everywhere, why you should imagine that I have overlooked so elementary, I say, I said, don't want to interrupt you, and all that sort of thing, but aren't these the little chaps? I pulled them out of the drawer and held them up. These look like pearls. What? I don't know when I've had a more juicy moment. It was one of those occasions about which I shall prattle to my grandchildren, if I ever have any which at the moment of going to press seems more or less of a hundred to one shot. And Agatha simply deflated before my eyes. It reminded me of when I once saw some chappies letting the gas out of a balloon. Where, 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 she gurgled, in this drawer. They'd slid under some paper. Oh, said Aunt Agatha and there was a bit of a silence. I dug out my entire stock of manly courage, breathed her short prayer, and let her have it right in the thorax. I must say, Aunt Agatha Dashit, I said crisply, I think you have been a little hasty. What? I mean to say, giving this poor man here so much anxiety and worry and generally biting him in the gizzard You've been very, very unjust to this poor man. Yes, yes, chipped in the poor man. And this unfortunate girl, what about her? Where does she get off? You've accused her of pinching the things on absolutely no evidence. I think she would be jolly well advised to bring an action for, for whatever it is, and soak you for substantial damages. May we, may we, say, draw forth. 
shouted the bandit, chief backing me up like a good un. And the chambermaid looked up inquiringly as if the sun was breaking through the clouds. I shall recompense her, said Aunt Agatha feebly. If you take my tip, you jolly well will. And that, and that as soon as I write speedily. She's got a cast iron case. And if I were her, I wouldn't take a cent under twenty quid. But what gives me the pip most is the way you've abused this poor man. And tried to give his hotel a bad name. Yes, by damn, it's too bad, cried the whiskered Marvel. You careless old woman, you give my hotel bad names. Would you, or wasn't it, tomorrow you leave my hotel? And more to the same effect, all good, ripe stuff. And presently, having said his say, he withdrew, taking the chambermaid with him. The latter, with a crisp dinner, clutched in a vice-like grip. I suppose she and the bandit split it outside. A French hotel manager wouldn't be likely to let real money wander away from him without counting himself in on the division. I turned to Aunt Agatha, whose demeanor was now rather like that of one who, picking daisies on the railway, has just caught the down express in the small of the back. There was something you wished to speak to me about, I said. No, no, go away, go away. You said in your note, yes, yes, never mind. Please go away, Bertie. I wish to be alone. Oh, right oh, I said. Right oh, right oh. Head back to the good old suite. Ten o'clock, a clear night, and all's well, Jeeves, I said, breezing in. I am gratified to hear it, sir. If twenty quid would be any use to you, Jeeves, I am much obliged, sir. There was a pause, and then, well, it was a wrench, but I did it. I unstripped the cummerbund and handed it over. Do you wish me to press this, sir? I gave the thing one last longing look. It had been very dear to me. No, I said, take it away. Give it to the deserving poor. I shall never wear it again. Thank you very much, sir, said Jeeves. And that's the end of this story. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like this video,